For the third Sunday of Epiphany, our text is John's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, The Wedding at Cana. You hear lots of comments these days about couples who maybe go over the top with their wedding celebrations, spending thousands that they may not be able to afford to make memories that they hope will last a lifetime. At least in our culture, the marriage ceremony and reception normally take place over just one day. In Jesus' time, the wedding celebrations lasted a whole week. Lots of opportunities for things to go wrong and for huge loss of face. I wonder if they had wedding planners in those days. Ever since someone worked out how to make it, wine has been a favourite drink for meals, parties, celebrations and especially for weddings. Wine and weddings have gone hand in hand for centuries. The Bible tells us that wine is the oil of gladness, that wine brings joy to the party. Wine helps people smile. Wine helps people to be happy and people want to be happy at weddings. There are exceptions, of course. Some people don't drink wine for religious or other reasons, but generally people do enjoy drinking wine at weddings throughout the world. Wine is part of the celebration. The wedding at Cana is unique to John's Gospel and it's the first of Jesus' seven signs in his narrative. It presents an interesting contrast, contrast to next week's text from Mark. But both stories tell of the first acts of Jesus' public ministry, which provide important clues to who Jesus is for the respective author. For Matthew, there was the Sermon on the Mount. Why did he choose that? For Luke, Jesus returned to his hometown. Why did he choose that? We bring the same question to Mark and John for Mark next week. Why an exorcism? And for John, why turn water into wine? These two events back to back are more than appropriate for the second and third Sundays after Epiphany. One dictionary definition of epiphany is a usually sudden manifestation or perception of the essential nature or meaning of something, or an illuminating discovery, realisation or disclosure. There is something in the first acts of Jesus' public ministry in each of the four Gospels which help us to come to our own epiphany. They reveal something about who Jesus is and what Jesus will do. We should remember that the miracles Jesus performs in John's Gospel are never called miracles, but signs. In other words, the miracle itself is not really what we're supposed to see, as miraculous as it is. Turning water into wine would be quite something to experience, especially on a Sunday morning in Panath although perhaps not so attractive for those of us doing dry January. But there's more to it than just facilitating people having a good time, of course. The miracles, or signs, point to a truer revelation about Jesus. This could be an important way to move through the season of Epiphany. Revelation for revelation's sake is really not the point. So what deeper reality is Jesus revealing? And what are we supposed to see about Jesus? The word grace isn't much used in John's Gospel, and actually it only appears in the prologue in chapter 1. Why? Many scholars argue that John's source for the prologue was actually a hymn that he borrowed and inserted into his narrative. But what if we take the Incarnation seriously and suggest that once the word becomes flesh, the rest of the gospel shows you what grace tastes like, looks like, smells like, sounds like, feels like. If we are shown something, isn't that infin infinitely more transforming than just being told about it? That is, Jesus' signs, they show you, they don't tell you what abundant grace is. 
From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, John tells us in the prologue. Turning water into wine is revealing of abundant grace in this season of Epiphany. And what does abundant grace taste like? It tastes like the best wine when you're expecting the cheap stuff. It's one thing to say Jesus is the source of grace. It's quite another to have an experience of it. So much of our teaching today tends toward telling people about Jesus. What if in the season of Epiphany, we commit to creating experiences of Jesus so there can be no doubt that Christmas was real. We shouldn't gloss over the sheer scale of abundance. There were six water jars, each of them holding 20 to 30 gallons. They weren't half full, they weren't three quarters full, they were filled to the brim and of the best wine. The amount in and of itself is extraordinary, but the best wine? At this point in a wedding celebration, it was unheard of. Back in the day, weddings typically lasted a week. The host would serve the better wine when the guests could actually taste what they were drinking. Perhaps today that would be a nice champagne. Only after a few days of drinking and determined levels of inebriation would the guests be served probably the equivalent of the cheapest Asti, I can't even say it, Asti Spumanti from the local discount shop? Where have you experienced this kind of grace? Perhaps we can even think out of the box and imagine these more tangible presences rather than reducing grace down to just a mere doctrine. Another important detail in this first sign, this first act of Jesus' public ministry, is that his mother is present. In John's Gospel, the mother of Jesus is never named. She's never called Mary. She's always denoted by her relationship to Jesus. And here, it is her urging that initiates Jesus' action. The exchange between Jesus and his mother is actually quite amusing. We should never do the Bible the disservice of telling people that it is devoid of humour. She notes that the wedding hosts have run out of wine. Jesus' response is something along the lines that they should have hired a better wedding planner. But then she tells the servants to do whatever Jesus says. And for me, this conjures up an image of the mother of Jesus, much like someone today encouraging their child to ride a bike without stabilisers for the first time. Come on, you can do it. I know you can. But I also wonder what she actually saw in that moment. What had Jesus already revealed to her up to that point that would cause her to believe that such a miracle was possible from him? How did she know that this was the time for revelation, the event of Epiphany. The mother of Jesus appears only twice in John's Gospel, at the wedding of Cana and then again at the foot of the cross. We're not told here about her reappearance later in the Gospel, but we get a hint of her return in Jesus' reason for what seems to be a refusal of her request. My hour has not yet come. Throughout John's Gospel, Jesus refers to his hour, which signals the time of his death. It's more than poignant that the mother of Jesus brackets his life, surrounds Jesus' early earthly ministry. She's there at the beginning of his career, and then she is there to watch him die. She's the nurturing force when he is the word made flesh, a shared parenthood with God the Father. What difference does this make for this text in the season of Epiphany? Perhaps it might help us to remember Jesus in a manger in the midst of miracles. Perhaps it is a reminder that whenever Jesus reveals his divinity, he's simultaneously revealing something about his humanity. Perhaps in the sign that it of water into wine, we might even experience something that we need to know about ourselves. Amen.